Good morning. Huh. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> that was much better. Appreciate that. I hope you're all doing great. We have a number of visitors, a, a big crowd of visitors right here, and, and good to see you guys, and hope all of you just finish out the rest of this semester uh, all thumbs up and, and going strong. And uh, looking out, we have several other visitors with us, and certainly glad that you were here. I want to tell you a story that uh, I'm sure you've probably heard it before. If you haven't, you need to hear it. And uh, it's about an old country family that lived way out in the sticks. They were kind of like the Beverly Hillbillies, you know, the Clampets. They lived so far out, it wasn't the end of the world, but, you know, you could see it from there. You know, they lived so far out, you had to come back to town in order to hunt. You know, kind of one of those places. Well, they didn't have much, but they did have a radio and they had a telephone. And Ma, well, she won, uh, she called into the radio station and had won an expense-paid trip into the nearest uh, metropolitan town. And so they were going to go and stay in a hotel. They'd never stayed in a hotel before. They'd hardly been anywhere. Well, they loaded up the truck and put the kids in the, in the pickup bed and, and put their luggage in, and they rode into town. And when they pulled up in the town, they pulled up in front of this grand hotel. And sitting there under the canopy, the father looked over to the mother and said, Ma, you stay here with the kids, and me and Junior will go in and we'll check us in. And they walked into the lobby, and they came up to the reception desk and started checking them in. Well, the daddy happened to look over to the side, and he sees this elderly lady, and she's walking on a cane, and she steps out in front, in front of these doors. It was the elevator. He'd never seen an elevator before. She pushed a button. A light came on. All these lights above these doors started flickering. And then the doors opened up, and that little old lady, she stepped inside of that elevator. The doors closed back behind her, and the large light started flickering again. And, and a little bit later, the doors opened up. Ding, the doors opened up, and out walks this beautiful 25-year-old lady. Well, that father, his eyes were as big as saucers. He looked over at Junior and said, Junior, go get your mom. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if we could transform life that easily? But I know that's not the way that we want to transform life anyway, is it? God wants to transform our lives into the most useful people that we could possibly be. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be joy-filled. But more than anything, He wants to transform us to look like His Son, Jesus. And that is the Spirit's work in our lives. And every single day, God is working inside of us, molding us and transforming us to look more like His Son. But now, God does an incredible amount of that work when we allow Him to fill our lives with His Spirit. Well, it's one thing to be filled with the Spirit, but it's another thing to be thrilled with the Spirit's indwelling. You see, God cannot transform a heart that's not willing to be transformed. This morning, I want to talk to you about transformation. And I want to talk to you about something that falls into our hands and our responsibility in that transformation. You know, I'm often dismayed at the lack of transformation among people who are supposed to be living transformed lives. I'm often dismayed at myself, out of the lack of transformation that I ought to be living in the transformed lives. And one of the ways that we do that is that we quench the Spirit's work in that transformation. And one way that we do that is that we fail to tune in to the Spirit's Word. And if I truly desire for there to be a, a transformation in my life, 
then I must be in tune with what the Spirit wants to teach me from the Word of God. You see, the key to transform behavior is letting the Word of God take root in your heart. And the key to the Word taking root in your heart is in how you receive it. I'd say if any one of you, if you were to go home this afternoon and you decided that you wanted to listen to the radio, you'd probably walk up to the radio and you'd turn it on. Maybe you'd start turning a few knobs and uh, turn it on AM or FM or, or maybe there's a CD that you wanted to listen to or plug in your iPhone into, uh, into it and, and listen to something that, some music that you have downloaded. And if you were to go home and turn on your radio and try to set it and listen to some music and nothing came on, what would you do? Well, you might uh, look back behind, make sure that it's plugged in. You might check and make sure that the knobs are not messed up, that the, the station is turned to the right place, that all the lights are on, and, or maybe it's battery operated. You might check to see if, if there's any batteries in the back or if it needs to be charged. But i tell you something that you would not do. You would not say, well, I know there's no such thing as radios. It's all just a big hoax. No, there's, there's no such thing as radio waves. No, you wouldn't do that. There's no doubt in the world that there are radios. There's no doubt in the world that there are radio waves. If there is a re problem, if there is a problem with the reception, the problem is not in the radio problem is in the receiver. The Word of God has the ability to transform lives. Do you believe in the transformative power of the Word of God? There's no doubt that it can transform lives. There is no doubt that the Word of God can guide us and instruct us and help transform us into something more useful and more loving and more like Jesus than we've ever been before. There's no doubt in its transforming power. And so there, there, there's not, if there is not any transformation, the problem is not in the Word. The problem is in the receiver. If you would, turn your Bibles over to James chapter 1, verses 19 to 25. In this passage, James tells us how to improve our reception so that the Word of God can do what it's meant to do. And he does this by showing us three ways that we hinder its reception. Let's read this together. My dearly beloved brothers, understand this. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and evil, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save you. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but one who does good works, this person will be blessed in what he does. James shows us three ways that we hinder good reception. Here's the first one. Oh, I'm sorry, I went backwards. Good reception is hindered by an arrogant spirit. Many years ago, you know, back before TV, people just they bought radios and they listened to radios. I heard a story about a man who lived in a little community outside of Nashville, Tennessee. 
And he went out and he bought himself a brand new radio. And he brought that radio home. And he set that radio to AM 650. <laughs> AM 650 is where you turn your radio in order to listen to the Grand Ole Opry on a Saturday night. And he got it exactly where he wanted to listen to it. And then he adjusted the volume exactly to the level that he wanted to listen to. Then he went out into his wood shop. And he grabbed a couple of pliers and came back and ripped the knobs right off of that radio. You know why he did that? Because he didn't want anybody else tampering with what he wanted to listen to. He knew exactly what he wanted to listen to it, and nobody else was going to change the channel. Nobody else was going to change the volume. Have you ever known anybody like that spiritually? They've got it all figured out. They know everything that they are supposed to know. And it's the way that they've always known it. And no one ever better ever teach them anything new. That is an arrogant spirit, isn't it? James tells us, here is how you can detect these people. They will exhibit the exact opposite qualities that James talks about in verses 19 and 20. Instead of being very quick to listen, well, they'll be very slow to listen. They don't want to hear anybody else's point of view. And the second thing that they'll do is they'll be, is rather than being quick to listen, they'll be very quick to tell you their opinion. And the third thing that they will do is, rather than being slow to, angry, ang to be angry, they will be very quick to hold in contempt anybody that thinks differently than they do. See, if the Word of God is going to take root into your heart, then you have to have a teachable spirit. God's Word cannot take root inside of a heart that has had the poison of pride poured upon it. Now, Time Magazine, several years ago, had an article that said that most people, by the time that they turn 35, will never accept a new idea or a new thought or a new opinion. Folks, God doesn't want us to be so static in our learning and ingesting the nutrition of the Word of God. He wants us to be teachable. He wants us to be people of good reception. Now, here's the second thing James tells us. That good reception is hindered by unattended sin. Take a look at verse 21 again. Therefore... Ridding yourselves of all moral filth and evil, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save you. So James tells us that good reception is hindered by unattended sin. You see what James says there? He says, you need to get rid of moral filth. You see that word filth there or filthiness? Well... It is a derivative of a Greek word, or a medical term in the original Greek, which means, literally means, earwax. Now, can you imagine the word picture that James is trying to teach us here? James is trying to tell us, he's saying, if you have sin, unattended, petted, nurtured sin, then it is like you are plugging your ears with earwax so that you cannot hear what God is trying to teach you. Let me give you an example of that. Y'all remember the story of David? It's okay that if you don't. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, David did some really bad things. He committed adultery with a woman by the name of Bathsheba. And understanding that she is pregnant, then... then he had her husband killed. 
Now, D David had a really good friend by the name of Nathan. Nathan was a prophet and a friend of God and a friend of David. And Nathan comes to David. He says, David, I want to tell you a story. And he tells him this parable about a ewe lamb. There was a rich man and a poor man, and the rich man had several lambs. And the poor man, he had just one little lamb. And this ewe lamb was like a baby to him. He nurtured that baby, and he petted that baby, and it was like a family member to him. The rich man, there was a stranger who had come in for a visit. And he wanted to, he wanted to be hospitable. And rather than killing one of his own lambs for the visitor, he goes and he takes that precious little ewe lamb that belonged to that one poor man. David, he was outraged. He said, well, that man, he ought to be killed. He ought to pay back this man four lambs because of what he has done. And that's when Nathan said, David, you're the man. David was filled with so much unattended sin that he couldn't even see the truth as it was being taught to him. If you have sin in your heart, God cannot flood your soul with its truth. Jesus often used the metaphor that the Word of God is like a seed that is planted unto the soul of a, a person's heart. Matthew chapter 13 is one of the parables that we love, the parable of the sower. And in that parable, Jesus tells about how a sower was scattering seed. And some of that seed fell among the thorns. And even as that plant was beginning to, to sprout up, it didn't last because the thorns choked it out. Well, James picks up on that exact same metaphor. And he says, you need to humbly receive the word of God that has been planted into you. I'm not a very good gardener. I'm one of those people with a black thumb, not a green thumb. I don't know too much, but I do know this. You cannot take seed and toss it into a bed of weeds and expect something fruitful to grow. No, what you've got to do, you've got to reach down, you've got to start pulling up those weeds and pulling them up by the root. And you've got to cultivate the soil and make it prepared for the seed to get into the soil and to germinate and to sprout up and to fruit up. It's not going to bear fruit so long as it's being choked out by the weeds. Folks, God's Word is living it is active, it is powerful, but even Jesus says, and James says this too, God's Word cannot take root in a heart that is filled with unaddressed sin. It cannot take root when there's unaddressed sin. Here's the third thing. And we're down to verses 22 through 25. Good reception is hindered by shallow interest. Good reception is hindered by shallow interest. I like to read. Do we have any people who like to read here? Oh, yeah. That's okay if you don't raise up your hand. You're still smart. I still think you're intelligent. But I struggle with reading. Uh, I, this is a little saying that I say quite often. Uh, I don't read many books. I read books many times. And the reason why is my reading comprehension is just not as good as, as, as I would like for it to be. And so I read books more. I don't read more books. I read books more, more intensely reading it over and over and over again because I want to be able to get it. If it's a good book that has great information, I'll read it more than once because I don't want it just to be down on the page. I want it to be right here. Have you ever gotten a, a love letter before? How do you read a love letter? 
I've gotten some love letters from Jennifer before, a long time ago. <laughs> I tell you how you read over a love letter, you pour over every single word, don't you? You intensely read it. Let's suppose for a moment that you have an old maid aunt. She has passed away, and she was a millionaire. And you are the sole name on the will. Now, when you show up for the reading of that will, how do you think you're going to listen? I know how you're going to listen to the reading of that will. Let me give you one more example. Let's suppose that you are a captain in the Rangers Special Forces and you are in combat and your superior officer calls you in to go over a battle plan for you to lead seven men to invade a heavily uh, fortified warehouse. Now you tell me, how are you going to listen? You're going to pay attention, aren't you? You're going to listen to every single word that is being said. Because these are grave circumstances. And you are responsible for seven lives going into this battle. Now the reason why I asked you to think about those three different scenarios is because God's Word is a love letter to His children. It's the most precious love letter that has ever been written. God's Word is the promise of the, of the greatest inheritance that you will ever receive. And God's Word is the battle, plan, the battle plan against the fiercest evil that the world has ever encountered. How do you read the Word of God? You pour over it like a love letter. You intensely listen to it as if it's the words of an inheritance. You pay attention because it is the battle plan for your life. James says that there are people who are glancers, and there are people who are gazers. You know what a glancer is? A glancer is somebody who just sort of takes the word of God and treats it like a piece of chewing gum. They stick in their mouth, they, they chew on it for a little bit, get the sweetness, and then they just sort of spit it out. God's Word is meant to have much greater substance than that. It's meant to be digested. Now take a look at verses 22 to 25. But be doers of the Word, and not hearers only deceiving yourselves, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of liberty, into the perfect law of freedom, and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but one who does good works, this person will be blessed in what he does. Now James encourages us to be gazers. You know what it means to be gazers? Well, I'll tell you, here, here are a couple of practices that gazers have. First of all, they meditate. You know what meditation is? David says, Your law I have meditated on all, all through the night. Day and night I meditate upon your law. You know what meditation is? You know, it, it's not just you know, sitting in a dark room with candles lit, you know, cross leg and hmm, humming. And you know what meditation is. I guarantee you, you meditate. You ever worry about anything? You know what worry is? Worry is negative meditation. It's taking a negative thought and thinking on it over and over and over again. Well, you know what meditation is. Would to God that we could take a positive thought and think on it over and over and over again. That we could think about Jesus' life and loving others and thinking on that over and over and over again. Here's another practice of people who are gazers. People who are gazers, they also memorize. 
Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, one of the things that I love about the time that we live in is that I can go out to just about any store and buy me another copy of one of these. It's such a ready, accessible source of information that I can go anywhere and I can find it. You know, we sometimes forget that for the first thousand years of Christianity, they didn't have that. Now, if they knew the Word of God, they had to hear it here, and then they had to know it here. And I'm afraid that we have become so accustomed to the ready accessibility of a Bible, and we have apps for our phones. I love to use my app. You know, there are times I walk around without even a, a book in hand because, well, I've got... I've got three or four translations right on my phone. And I can pull it up. The trouble with that is because since it's so accessible, I have it here, but I don't put it here. And I don't put it here. God's Word doesn't do me any good so long as it stays here. It only does me some good if it's here. And here's the third practice of people who are gazers. They model what they have been taught. One of the ways that the devil deceives us so that we are not being transformed into Jesus is that we substitute information for transformation. We become too content with just having information rather than being transformed by it. And that's what James is talking about. The word picture that he's using is standing before a mirror. Why do you stand before a mirror? Why didn't you get in front of a mirror this morning? Well, you had to check and make sure you had some bed head. Maybe you had to shave. You know, check and make sure that, you know, your face was on right. You, you look at yourself in the mirror so that you can make adjustments. And that's what, what James is telling you. He's telling us the mirror is not an end in and of itself. The mirror is there to increase our awareness for making transformation. And the Word of God is exactly the same. The Word of God is not, or the, our Bibles, is not just an end in and of itself. You listen to the Word of God as a means to transform character. And James says, he says, if you will do these three things, if you will linger over the Word, if you will fall in love with the Word, and you will live out what is being taught in the Word, then your life will be blessed indeed. You will be transformed. You will look more like Jesus. The question this morning, it's not, do you have the Word? The question is, does the Word have you? Not, do you have the Word? But does the Word have you? As a little boy growing up in Paris, Tennessee, this was long before Titan's era, like most little boys in my town, we were Dallas Cowboy fans. Yeah, just a few of you just kind of perked up right then, didn't you? And a longtime coach for the Dallas Cowboys, and, and I really, I'm going to be honest, I don't know much about the organization anymore. All that matters to me was the coach, Tom Landry. Longtime coach, and he was known to be a man of great faith. And whenever he passed away, there was an article written in a Fort Worth uh, newspaper, a man by the name of Jim Reeves. And at the conclusion of the article, he makes what is perhaps one of the greatest compliments that could be given to any man. He said, Tom Landry was a reason to take a closer look at the Bible. 
Could you imagine somebody looking at your life, seeing such a transformation, seeing such a spirit-driven life, seeing such an example of who Jesus is, that they look at you and say, you give me a reason to take a closer look at the Bible. Does the word have you? If not, please come while we stand and sing.